Okay, joining me on the other side of my screen today is Dr. Brian Carson from the University of Limerick over in Ireland, and I'm very excited to chat with you today because you are in an area of research that's a bit novel um, with the intensities of exercise, which we're going to get into with nutri nutrient timing around higher intensity exercise, which not a lot of people are studying. So um, before we jump into all that, I would love if you could give yourself an introduction um, and maybe some of your research background, and then we'll jump into your current research interests. Okay. Uh, well, thanks, Rusty, for the invitation to come on. Um, I'm really flattered uh, to get the invite and uh, look forward to discussing a little bit of the science that we're doing here uh, in Limerick uh, over the next hour or so. Um, so I guess a little bit of background maybe on my research journey. Um, I did an undergraduate uh, degree in sports science and health at Dublin City University. And while there, I did an undergraduate project under Professor Niall Moyna, uh, and we looked at metabolism um, with carbohydrate feeding um, and some high intensity exercise actually and its ability to sustain high intensity exercise and that was my undergraduate project and probably sparked the, the research interest for me and I think that that's probably a similar tale for a lot of uh, academics and researchers uh, so my first real research experience and um, from there I decided that I'd like to do a PhD and that I'd like to go into academia uh, and I was fortunate enough to win an Irish Research Council uh, scholarship uh, to work with Dr. Donald O'Gorman, again at uh, Dublin City University. So I did my PhD uh, there from 2005 to 2009. Uh, and what we were looking at was adaptation to uh, different intensities and different contraction frequencies um, during exercise, um, principally looking at metabolic gene expression um, from the mitochondria uh, and how they reacted to both acutely, well, mainly acutely. Um, so we looked at that and enjoyed my experience there. After my PhD, um, I went to the University of Liverpool to work with Dr. Sylvia Mora. Um, and the reason to go there was I wanted to expand. I'd done a lot of human work as part of my undergrad and PhD work. And I wanted to expand my skill set. Um, and I was working in cell-based models. I was actually looking at adipocytes there and adiponectin trafficking um, through the exosomal pathway um, during my time at, at at University of Liverpool. And then um, after about 18 months there, uh, I got an offer to take up a 10 month post at the University of Limerick. And you're actually talking to me, um, last week was my uh, anniversary in, in UL. So I'm here over 12 years now. So I came for 10 months and I'm here for 12 years. So <laughs> a little bit of a Hotel California going on. <laughs> um, you can never leave, but uh, no, I've enjoyed my, I was very lucky to get that uh, opportunity and since secured a tenure position and, and promotion then and, and secured tenure and um, so I've been lucky to be here for the last 12 years and I've enjoyed um, you know leading my own program of research here and I work with some great collaborators and um, work with Professor Phil Japen who some might be, uh, be aware of or heard of and Dr. Dix, uh, Professor Dick Fitzgerald and Dr. Catherine Norton are my close collaborators here at UL so we have other collaborators nationally and maybe some of them will come up in in, in the discussion later on so yeah, uh, that's pretty much my research journey to date. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I read the title of your PhD dissertation and I was like, wow, this is exactly what I would want to be doing my PhD in. <laughs> and there's a lot of overlap. Did it? Did your findings from your PhD motivate you to look at sprint interval training, um, what you're doing now currently? Yeah, so um, I guess it was a natural development. I mean, I've done, I've probably been... Uh, for if, if people were being critical, they could say sometimes my research lacks some focus. Um, <laughs> we actually started out looking with Dr. Brendan Egan, who's at who's back at Dublin City University now. We did our PhD roughly the same time. Brendan was about a year ahead of me. Um, and we were Donald's first PhD students. So we did a lot of work together. We set up the lab. We were lucky, actually, both of us to spend some time in Professor Julian Zirat's lab at the Karolinska. Um, where we got trained in a lot of the wet lab techniques because we didn't have those skills and we were able to bring them back to the lab. But our first study together looked at um, high intensity versus low intensity exercise. Um, so 80% VO2 max versus 40% VO2 max and the adaptation of mitochondrial uh, genes in response to that. And we saw 
much greater upregulation um, and expression of those genes after high intensity exercise um, with the same caloric expenditure, same overall load effectively. Um, so that was an interesting start and probably where the higher intensity side of uh, research comes from. So yeah, it was, it was a natural progression into that. Okay, so let's jump into your recent sprint interval training study. So why did you choose sprint interval training over like high intensity interval training? Okay, so during my time at uh, Limerick, where I became more interested in the interaction between exercise and, and nutrients. And um, so, you know, we've done some work around um, post-exercise, myofibular protein synthesis and so on. And there's an obvious synergy between uh, nutrition and exercise. So kind of building on that and my interest in high intensity interval type training, it, it seemed a natural progression for me to figure out what differences there may be in terms of the peri-training nutrition in terms of metabolic adaptations and responses. I wasn't so interested in uh, necessarily what just happens acutely, but what happens over time and um, with training and the studies we're going to talk about today focus on, you know, short-term training um, at least. I became very interested in, in a phenomenon when we were, when I was doing my PhD, it was a paper by Kluberton in 2005. And it showed that when you pre-fed carbohydrate pre-exercise, that some of the adaptations, at least in terms of gene expression, were blunted in the carbohydrate condition compared with a fasted condition. And that paper stuck with me. And at and what was intensity what on, was that endurance? That was at a moderate intensity. So something like 70% VO2 max. But <clears throat> what I was interested in was, would that hold in high intensity interval training and sprint interval training? And then what are the effects of doing that um, or for a period of training? So yes, we see lots of differences in um, potentially in gene expression or in signaling that might happen very acutely. But what is the accumulation of the effect of those? And ultimately, would that have an impact on either health or performance? So that's, I guess, where the genesis of the, the idea for these papers came from. And um, so there's probably two papers we're principally going to discuss today. One looks at um, a fasted versus carbohydrate fed, uh, and the other actually looks at fasted versus protein fed, which is, I suppose, a little bit of a novel paradigm, and we might get to that um, later on. I should say at this point, I'd like to say certainly at the outset, and um, just in case there's any perceived conflicts of interest out there, these studies were supported by Carberry Food Ingredients Limited, but we would have designed the studies and done all the analysis independent uh, of the industry partner. So it's better to declare these things um, at the outset. But yeah, that's where the genesis of this idea came from. Um, one of the reasons I was interested in protein, pre-exercise protein feeding versus fasted was the idea that perhaps there might be additional benefits with pre-exercise protein feeding in terms of an amino acid supply for even the immediate post-exercise period. Um, and whether the building blocks there in terms of those amino acids might be there to stimulate uh, muscle protein synthesis to a greater extent. Um, so that was part of that. So these two papers um, were really designed together at the same time um, with, with those in mind. So uh, I guess we'll get into each of the individual papers as we go on. Yeah. So wait, they were, were you doing both these studies at the same time and they, you just yeah. published on a different, Oh, okay. Yeah. So like the first one that was published was the protein versus fasted. Um, so I was thinking that like you did that study and that motivated you to do a new study, but that's interesting because they weren't that the next study wasn't based on the findings of the first one, which is no, no. So the, the, the two ideas came. So originally actually the, the second publication, um, 2023 publication is really was probably what the idea I would have had first um, and then the the protein uh, idea was was to come afterwards and um, just different priorities in terms of the timing of publication with an industry partner who had funded work they obviously wanted to maybe prioritize uh, that publication so that's part of the timing issue but gotcha. no those studies would have been designed at the same time and actually run at the same time cool okay well let's start with the carbohydrate feeding um so the recent 2023, 2023, 2022, yep. 2023. Well, um, I think it's late 2022, but it'll be a 2023 paper officially. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's start with that. So explain the methods and what you guys did, and then we'll, we'll go into the findings and maybe explain some of those. 
Okay, so um, pretty much the, the design was fairly simple. It was an overnight fast. So just it's important to, to point out the different types of fasted exercise that there might be and, and there's differences in terms of the adaptation that might happen. So this was just an overnight fast. We didn't exercise in the evening before, like others like um, John Hawley or James Morton or Graham Close of those guys might have done, um, which to deplete muscle glycogen. We didn't do that. And um, all it was was an overnight fast. So principally what you're talking about probably is a change in liver glycogen, um, right. ultimately. Um, so I think that's important to, to get that distinction out is that an overnight fast does not cause a change in muscle glycogen content it is primarily liver glycogen which is exactly what you just said i just want to highlight that for anyone listening who thinks that oh they're working out in a glycogen depleted state when they're not but anyways it's i will just, let you go on just liver glycogen depletion so you know to keep your blood glucose or to maintain your blood glucose overnight um your your blood glucose will come from two sources and um, your liver glycogen and then gluconeogenesis so um, that liver glycogen depletes overnight uh, as, as we haven't fed. Um, <clears throat> so that's that's the only real distinction here in the, in the two conditions. So in the fasted condition, we fasted overnight and we will give them a placebo and drink in the morning, same color, texture, feel, et cetera. In the carbohydrate condition, um, they would get roughly about, it depended on their, their kilogram body mass, but they would get roughly 75 grams of carbohydrate. And the idea was we'd actually worked it out based on the timing, the volume of exercise and roughly uh, carbohydrate oxidation rates. So we were effectively trying to give them what they would use during the actual uh, sprint interval training session. Mm. Interesting. So they and is it just like first... glucose mainly? Yeah. So just maltodextrin. Okay. And okay. so they would get that 75 grams of maltodextrin in the morning, but 45 minutes pre pre-exercise. And in the fasted group, we would just give them a placebo. And did you, and what they would, sorry, I keep interrupting you, but did you measure any, um, did you do like any blood glucose or blood insulin testing? No, we actually didn't. Um, for the reason that we weren't that interested in that, we, we knew insulin would go up in, right. the, in the glucose condition and we knew it wouldn't in, in the faster condition. <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't really going to explain anything. Now, the insulin, of course, may have an, uh, an effect on, on some of the adaptations and some of the responses that we see for sure, but it was not something we felt we needed uh, to, to verify as such. We, we knew insulin will go up. That's been proven. We didn't need to do that. This right. was, was the rationale there. Okay. So um, we, we did that in the morning. Prior to that, prior to their actual feeding, what we would have done on, on day one is we would have taken a resting muscle biopsy uh, and a resting blood sample. And we took another blood sample just prior to exercise. And then we took uh, blood samples again, uh, immediately post-exercise and for an hour, uh, up to an hour post-exercise. And for our muscle biopsies, we took uh, a biopsy three hours post-exercise on day one. And the reason for that three hour timing was previous research would have shown that around three to five hours, you probably see a peak in uh, mitochondrial gene expression uh, at that time. Um, as the adaptation is, is, is beginning as that signal is there so on day one they came in they had their meal and 45 minutes later they began their exercise session short warm-up and then on day one they would do four wing gate sprints separated by four minutes uh, recovery and um, so yeah a tough trial for our participants our participant population were recreationally active males and they were not endurance trained so there was a bit of room for a training stimulus there yeah. Do you want to explain what a wing gate is? Yeah. So for uh, the the perhaps naive and maybe luckily so, a, a wing gate is a is a really tough. It's thirty seconds of your maximal power output. You're cycling against seven and a half percent of your body mass um, resistance, um, so it's it's quite a load, um, and it's very difficult to maintain for the thirty seconds. Um, so yeah, these are sometimes called uh, puke bucket studies. Mm. Um, we had one in reserve all the time. Not that we had to use it too often, thankfully. Um, but yeah, they're they're a tough exercise mode. So they would do four of those in the in the first session, and each one separated by four minutes recovery. And um, after that, like I said, we take a blood sample and we sample blood for the next hour, and then we take that uh, 
post exercise muscle biopsy three hours after the, the exercise session had completed. They would eat nothing in that time. They could drink water, I'd limit them. Um, and then they would, after three hours, they would we'd get them a snack and some lunch and, uh, and they'd go home for the day. So that's what day one looked like. And then what we did was we repeated that a further eight times. Now we didn't need to take samples on the rest of those occasions. So we used our training and the training stimulus was progressive. So in week one, typically, they would do Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. So they would do three times per week. So in week one, they would do four wing gates per session. And then in week two, it progressed to five wing gates per session. And in week three, it was six wing gates per session. And that was standardized across all participants. And then what we did um, between 72 and 96 hours after the last session, so to make sure there wasn't any, I guess, signal from the very last session, um, but that you know, any of the training adaptations hadn't dissipated between 72 and 96 hours. What we would do is we would take a resting fasted uh, blood sample and a uh, muscle biopsy at that point in time. And you can compare um, that one to the pre acute, like the, the pre before the first bout. Biopsy. Correct. Correct. Okay. So exactly that. So that was in the same, they were fasted and resting for both conditions before they had any of the feeding conditions on day one. So you could compare, effectively, we could look at, on day one, we could look at the acute effect. So the acute response to the bout of exercise and, and the nutrition interaction. And then the post-training biopsy, effectively against the, the first resting, will give us our training response. So you have acute and a, and a short chronic, for, for want of a better term. Three weeks isn't exactly a huge um, duration for a, a training event. We might discuss some of the weaknesses in the design. Um, from that perspective also but we chose just to maybe give some of the rationale on that why did we go with three weeks well we knew from a lot of um, martin cabala's work that you know you can see an adaptation in lots of the markers that we wanted to look at within actually two weeks within six sessions and we actually piloted six sessions and, and we looked at some of the performance adaptations. so we also me measured performance prior to the trial and after the trial or after training apologies um, we actually piloted two weeks initially and we didn't see huge effect size um, in our hands over two weeks of training so we piloted three weeks then so we actually had to do two undergraduate projects we thought look we'll establish the the effect size we'll establish the sensitivity for change in, in the first one of two weeks and we thought it would be fine and it was just a little bit borderline. And um, so we decided to extend the duration of the intervention. And we did that. And we saw that we, we had a bigger change or potentially a bigger effect size. So that's where the three weeks actually came from. So for the markers we were interested in, we saw, thought we'd see improvements in performance and some of the metabolic markers as well uh, within three weeks. And, and that actually proved to be the case. So um, that rationale was justified afterwards. Were you um, concerned at all about like 96 hours seems like a lot post training were you concerned that you would lose maybe some of the adaptations not really no okay. um i think most of them are 72 we just left ourselves a 96 hour window just in case and most of them were within three days so for example that wouldn't be terribly different than if they trained on friday and then they were trained on monday again right so, and typically okay. that's what it was so yeah no we weren't we weren't concerned that we would lose uh, the adaptation um look might, might it have been a factor and uh, maybe contributing to some of the dampening of some of the responses that we've seen in some participants perhaps but overall i think would be comfortable yeah yeah and i guess it would be same between the two conditions anyways correct correct um so what did you guys find okay so uh, just some some interesting findings um what we saw was so first of all just to to put out there Exercise is king in this uh, scenario, right? The, the the nutrient condition is is, is very much queen, um, and and will have some small effects. But from what's kind of comforting as a researcher when you're looking, you say, okay, what should happen here with the exercise training itself? If you take the group as a whole, what we see were uh, large changes in acute and in some chronic uh, gene expression under the genes you'd expect to change, and they change to roughly the right proportions so yeah you were happy you had that security that the the exercise intervention had worked we saw changes in performance across the group as well which is obviously important as well you know that's what you expected that's what we originally did the this the length and duration of the the intervention on those effect 
exercises they were retained. So that, that was important to see. <clears throat> and then when we look at the, the two conditions, what we saw were um, some small differences in some acute gene expression. So again, one of the ones which we would have outlined, and I'll go back to that Kluberton paper all that time ago, one of the ones we'd expect to see a change in is PDK4. Um, so again, we, we saw a difference between groups for PDK4, and that gives us some security that the model you know, is working to an extent of what we expected to see was happening. Yeah. The other interesting, do, you, do you want to just explain what PDK4 does? And... PDK4's role, I guess, is like, like a switch between carbohydrate and fat metabolism. So if you have an adequate supply of carbohydrate, you know, the muscle will preferentially use it if it can. Um, and therefore, you'll see a dampening of the upregulation of PDK4, whereas in the fasted condition, you'll see greater upregulation of, of PDK4 expression uh, post-exercise. So we had seen that before, and that's been kind of well published in the literature, or, or it's, it's been replicated uh, a number of times. So again, there was a bit of security that our data look right and, and that all our methods look right from that perspective. What was interesting from an acute perspective is we also saw differences in two genes associated with NAG, NAD uh, biosynthesis and scavenging, which was, which was interesting. And that was something um, we decided to look at. We, you know, there's a lot of research focuses on a typical mitochondrial proteins and transcription factors like your PGC1 alpha, NRF2, PPAR delta. But less papers have looked at these NAD-related genes. Um, labs like um, Andy Philp um, down in Australia, they've done it. And actually was reading those papers and the data paper in the American Journal of Physiology uh, with Ben Stokes not too long ago. And they had looked at this in kind of moderate intensity exercise. So we decided we'd have a look at those and that proved to be fruitful. So we saw differences between groups in NNMT and NAMPT, okay, which are two genes associated with NAD uh, biosynthesis. Um, and that's important in, in just the overall metabolism and health of the muscle. And those changes, and for PDK4, would have been theoretically preferential for uh, the fasted condition. Okay, so again, what we're to refer back to a term we used earlier on, you know, we saw some blunting of the mitochondrial genes um, in the carbohydrate condition. Okay, so that, so that actually held up. And, and they were the three genes that we saw that. We also looked at <clears throat> chronic gene expression. Now, you can question that approach and say, okay, well, what does that mean? You know, gene expression and acutely after exercise, you can understand why that change is interesting. And then how much of that is actually translated to a change in the protein, which is obviously going to have the function in the muscle. So why would you look at chronic gene expression? Well, potentially the, the underlying or baseline activity of those uh, genes, I think is going to be important for the overall translation. So you're looking for changes in that baseline and uh, turnover of these. So we're, again, we're comparing the baseline measurement pre versus the, the resting measurement post-training. And we saw differences in, in two genes there, two genes of interest, NRF2 and PPAR delta. Um, PPAR delta probably the more interesting of the two in its terms of its role with um, uh, fatty acid oxidation. Okay, um, And again, these were more considered more favorable changes for the, the fasting state compared to the carbohydrate fed state. So higher levels of these genes at rest. <clears throat> Um, we saw some uh, differences between groups in some of the acute protein signaling we looked at, like panacetylation and paralation. But ultimately, really, they were um, I would ignore those for the reason that I mean, if you look at the data in the paper, it's clear to see that ultimately there were differences in the baseline between those groups. So though the changes look different, they're actually not. They're actually the change is around the same. So that's one to just skip over. But from a chronic protein perspective, we see greater deacetylation, and I would put more stock in this, greater deacetylation in the fasted condition. So and that's for panacetylation. So that's for acetylation of all proteins within the muscle. And this is potentially favorable, again, uh, for that fasted condition. For example, like deacetylated PGC1-alpha is, is the active form of uh, PGC1-alpha. And therefore, uh, regulating downstream mitochondrial gene expression and so on.
So yeah, that was that was an interesting finding. For the likes of um, the actual mitochondrial enzymes, we looked at two mitochondrial enzymes and um, citrate synthase, a marker of mitochondrial biogenesis. And we also looked at one enzyme from the beta oxidation pathway, uh, beta HAD or three hydroxyase or CoA dehydrogenase. So I, I struggle to say that half the time. So beta HAD will work for me. Um, we didn't see any change in beta HAD, and we did see, and we didn't see a statistical difference in citrate synthase activity. But we saw a large effect size, and I wouldn't discount that for our small numbers of participants in a study. What's biologically meaningful or physiologically meaningful, um, you know, it's worth looking at effect sizes, and that was actually a large effect size. And again, would have been probably more favorable for the for the uh, fasted condition, but. It wasn't statistically different. I will acknowledge that. Okay, just the case saying the stats guys out there come after me. <laughs> um, and then, as well as that, we saw um, some differences in the metabolome. And I know you're interested in this, Christy. So we, we might come back to this later on. Um, I have a collaborator at University College Dublin, Africa Sullivan, and there is limited information out there on the metabolome and response to exercise training, and particularly sprint interval training. And there's nothing known about sprint interval training and, and uh, different nutrient conditions. So I recruited Africa at the time to say, look, we're going to have these samples. Is it worthwhile looking at this? And uh, she was very keen to get involved. And one of the things we saw was we saw, again, somewhat of an exercise response, uh, minimal difference between the groups with some um, decrease in the acyl carnitines in the fasted condition. Uh, which you'd probably hypothesize uh, seems like a, a reasonable um, adaptation there. And we have some other metabolomic work in some of the other papers showing decreased um, circulating levels of fatty acids and their conjugates, um, which again um, suggests an increased fatty acid metabolism uh, potentially in a resting state after training. Um, and so I, th I think after training, important. like in general, or after training? after training in general, okay. um, and there are some suggestions, again, some not statistically significant, that this is true for the fastest state compared with carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. And it should be acknowledged that like, when you run um, the metabolome, probably the best way to look at things is a by a principal component analysis, where you compare the entire metabolome that you've measured, and um, between the conditions. And I should acknowledge we saw no difference between um, the conditions when you look at that. But when you go into individual metabolites, now bear in mind, we measured 167 metabolites here. So there are lots of opportunities to find differences. So you, you've got to apply um, strict false discovery rates and so on. Um, but yes, we saw some minor differences there, uh, but they were, they were minor. Um, ultimately, we think maybe we see some early adaptations in fatty acid oxidation and um, with three weeks of sprint interval training. Maybe that might be extended if, if you extended the actual, or those differences might be greater if you extended the actual protocol, but we don't know that at this point. So metabolomics, so you take like a blood sample and then you run this like shotgun approach that looks at these hundred and whatever me metabolites within our blood. Or serum. So there are a couple of approaches, and again, this was all a learning curve for me. And I'll defer to Africa. Should should you have any very technical questions, but you can take untargeted and targeted approaches. Uh, and we use a targeted approach, and um, we actually use a service out of the University of Alberta, and um, um, because I don't have the expertise, and we don't have the expertise in my lab to do that. So they ran um, this particular uh, targeted approach on these 167 metabolites. Uh, and they were the results that, that we got back. They hold true. Um, some of the really, again, uh, you want to have security in your data. What we expected to see maybe immediately post-exercise, one hour post-exercise, all of those things were regulated as you would expect. And then we really focused on the pre versus post-training uh, changes then. They were really of interest. We knew we'd see differences um, in some metabolites immediately post-exercise when you've given carbohydrate and when, when you've not, the differences in fatty acid metabolism during the exercise and carbohydrate metabolism during the exercise, they're kind of well known. But the, again, we have nice security around our data for that reason. Um, and then just some minor changes between pre and post-training. Okay, so like when you are using metabolomics, I won't go too into this because I know you, you said that this isn't necessarily your area of expertise, but like what are 
What can metabolomics tell us about the adaptations to training? Like, is it, is it about, it's just about metabolism. If we're finding like certain metabolites, it could, yeah, I don't know. I'm now I'm rambling. All yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a really good question. So what you're looking at when you take that sample is a snapshot of what's going on in that tissue. And so, you know, we took a large number of, of metabolites. We didn't nearly cover all of the metabolites you could look at in the blood. And you could also look at metabolites in the muscle um, and so on. And we were limited on uh, material and um, would have liked to do that, but we were limited on the material that we had uh, to do that. And it would have taken us um, a lot more material, which we didn't have ethics for. So <laughs> we didn't do that. But what you're looking at is a snapshot in that tissue of what metabolites have been produced. So you, you, from that, you can ascertain exactly, well, not exactly, but you can ascertain what's going on from a metabolic perspective. So for example, if you're seeing less of these um, fatty acids, for example, you know that more of those have been metabolized, particularly if you're seeing their metabolites in, in the serum as well, if that makes sense. Yeah. So again, if you see products of uh, carbohydrate metabolism there, then you understand that that's what's going on at that moment in time. So when we were looking at our pre-training and post-training resting samples, like you're setting a high bar, you're looking to see has there been such an underlying adaptation that even at rest, there's a difference between your between your resting samples. But that has been shown to be true. Um, there's some good research um, coming out of uh, uh, Munich at this point in time where they're looking at different uh, populations of athletes. So strength trained athletes versus endurance trained athletes. And what you see is a very, very different um, metabolomic profile uh, between those athletes, which reflects the type of fibers that they're using, uh, the phenotype of those athletes and so on. So Yeah, that's what again, I'm thinking. If that would be like a non-invasive way to, if we could correlate that with fiber type or whatever is going on in the muscle, that would be a really cool clinical yeah so what you'll see is you know that um you'll see differences in amino acids uh, circulating amino acids uh, between those populations uh differences in fatty acids and then in substrates and uh, metabolites of, of carbohydrate metabolism and there's quite clear differences when you look at trained populations so th those guys have uh, some really interesting work coming out so uh, i'd urge you to check out uh, yeah that's cool Awesome. Okay. Um, so what do you think is explaining the differences in adaptations? Like I know there were, were only a few with between the fasted and the carbohydrate fed during sprint interval training. Um, but what would it, what do you think are the underlying mechanisms? Because like a big argument or rationale for why we would see these differential adaptations with moderate intensity exercise is that we're changing fuel substrate utilization, but the Bergman and Brooks paper from 1990s showed that, which everyone references, um, showed that during high intensity interval or high intensity exercise, substrate utilization doesn't look different regardless of nutritional state. So I'm assuming sprint interval training wouldn't be different in terms of what fuels we're using. So if that's not explaining the results what do you think are the mechanisms yeah it's a it's a, it's a good question and um, so one of the things may be so obviously sprint interval training is interspersed with these uh, minutes of recovery and um, so though we're ultimately utilizing the same systems the challenge and supply of glucose to the muscle at those times is likely different and um, so overall i just think it's a slightly different challenge in terms of what the, the, the supply to the working muscle is and um, and be that through the actual interval of exercise and be that in the rest interval also so that may be um stimulating uh, some of the difference here and um, i should note just after exercise we didn't feed for a, a period after exercise so we wanted to give the the muscle I guess the system rather than just the muscle, the maximum exposure to that fasted state or that carbohydrate fed state. And we didn't feed till about 30 minutes post exercise. Bear in mind, so these guys were coming in uh, after an overnight fast. So you're trying to uh, elongate as much as possible and um, the time that they would spend in that condition in a practical way. Wait, so did I you just say 30 minutes? Of, yeah, 30 minutes after the exercise. Okay, so they did that. 
did the sprint interval training and then they rested 30 minutes and then they were allowed to eat. Yeah, then they were allowed to eat. So they just okay. getting a, a high protein and carbohydrate snack at that stage. So yeah, I think probably what's happened is in that overall period, there's a different nutrient supply um, to the muscle. And that's perhaps what's under underlying this. But we, we're not sure because we actually didn't measure what's going on during exercise. Um, and I'm certainly not going to take on George Brooks and, and, and those guys. I mean, I think they're right. Ultimately, the substrate utilization within that is within the exercise is going to be similar, but the supply and the challenge may be slightly different. Yeah, at high intensities and sprint, like all out max intensities, um, where is the fuel coming from? I, I should know the, the answer to this, but like, is it mainly local to the muscle endogenous fuels or is blood supplying glucose to our muscles during high intensity training? Yep, it's coming from a number of sources. So it's never one system at a time. It'll, it'll often be from multiple sources. So yeah, the blood glucose will be part of that overall supply. Okay, then because then that, as I we, guess- As we discussed be. earlier on, muscle glycogen shouldn't be impacted by- and the condition that we're exercising in here because it was just an overnight fast yeah so but if we're using like during the bout each 30 second bout like if we're using the same amount of glycogen in both muscle glycogen in both conditions like would like would we expect differences in fuel substrate utilization i think we're we're probably different in is how much blood glucose we might be using um, that might be the difference in exposure. Probably similar amounts of muscle glycogen because that muscle glycogen is available in both conditions. So that may explain it. We may be wrong on that hypothesis also. Um, but we, I suppose we took a suck it and see approach here um, just to try it with these because that's part of what you outlined as part of the rationale, perhaps why this work hadn't actually been done previously and why people had worked at lower exercise intensities because I thought ultimately there would be no difference. But we're noticing at least some differences here. So that may explain it, um, but I can't be sure on that. We didn't measure um, metabolism during exercise as such. Yeah, and like the adaptations that you did see, like increased PDK4 is interesting to me because that would imply that we are utilizing more fats, whether that's in like the post-exercise period or something, but something is blunting in the carbohydrate fed state, there's clearly a blunting of fat oxidation at some point, whether it's, it's, I don't know. You have a ready supply. Know. So you've already supplied coming from the blood of, uh, of blood glucose. So that, for me, that seems the obvious place that the, that the obvious underlying mechanism to me is that the blood glucose supply is different between the two. And right. then we see this change in, in, in PDK4. So we see more of an emphasis. It, it was still all... The predominant <laughs> uh, source here will still be a carbohydrate source to fuel that exercise during that uh, high intensity or that sprint interval. And um, there's no doubting that. But you're definitely seeing more of a reliance, at least, in uh, on on fat metabolism and um, during the overall session. Again, where that is 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 not clear at this point. Yeah, and would you like would next steps? I mean, if you're even interested in this question, but would next steps be to use something like tracers and see what fuels are being used because we can't use uh, RER to to see what fuels we're using during high intensity exercise? Sure. So we'd love to, we don't have the capability to do that here at Limerick, but we'd, we'd sure love to work with some collaborators to do that. And, you know, we might come on to the, to the next study in a moment. You know, that might be very important, particularly if you put in a protein versus fast versus carbohydrate. Because, again, we might want to see what happens to those protein, those amino acids, um, and how that might uh, facilitate other things like muscle protein synthesis post-exercise and so on. So, um, yeah, some tracer studies would be a really interesting way to go. If we can get yeah. that funded and get the, we can get the, the, the collaborations going, it would be great. Well, that was a nice intro into your fasted sit versus whey protein concentrate and then whey protein hydrosylate. hydrosylate. Um, yeah, if you want to ex explain yeah, that so study? So I think it was paper, the same methods. But yeah, so sim similar paradigm. Okay, so 
roughly the same study design um, in terms of same overnight fast, same timings in the morning, same tra training stimulus. The difference being that in this particular study were three groups. One was a fasted group and the other two groups were fed two different types of protein. So they were both given um, 0.33 grams protein per kilogram of their body mass. So if you're working off an 80 kilogram male, roughly 25 grams of protein is the best way to think about that. And one of the proteins was a whey protein concentrate. Um, and the other protein was a whey protein hydrolysate. Um, so if you're familiar or if you're not familiar with hydrolysis, what hydrolyzation effectively is a processing of the whey protein. Um, it's an enzymatic uh, processing. And ultimately what that does is it changes the profile of the peptides um, in the protein. So it doesn't change the amount of total protein or anything like that, but it changes the peptide chains that you know you might actually see in terms of metabolism. So sometimes it releases more smaller peptide chains. And ultimately the, the theory is around hydrolysis is that potentially that releases additional bioactivities so that these smaller peptides might be more bioactive in, in the metabolism. And the other uh, theory, and some there's some evidence to support this um, around hydrolysis, is that there, we have more rapid absorption and uptake of these to the bloodstream so that we'll, uh, the muscle effectively will see these earlier. And we've done some, we've had some looks at that, and we don't always see that. So I think that might depend on, on the hydrolysis. That's kind of sort of taken for granted that that is what hydrolysis do. Uh, I would just say that in, in our experience anyway, that's not always the case. And mm. um, <clears throat> what I mentioned earlier, we had an industry partner involved and, and they develop uh, protein hydrolysis as well. So they provided both of the proteins, uh, the, their whey protein concentrate and this new whey protein hydrolysis. Um, that was designed with the adaptations that we wanted to instill in mind. Now, did we, did they know, or did we know that it would actually have any impact? We didn't. And, and again, it was a little bit of a suck it and see approach. And for them, what they, you know, for industry side of things, so anybody who's in this, interested in industry kind of funded research, you know, ultimately for them, and um, they're trying to, I guess, maximize the end product. So they're actually a cooperative. So they're a dairy cooperative. So they're trying to give farmers the best price they can per liter of milk. And so if they can create additional value in a, in a protein that they sell to market, that obviously provides additional value for their farmers. So for them, the hydrolysis needs to outperform their standard whey protein, which is already very bioactive. And we know that from muscle protein synthesis studies. So it's actually a really high bar for, for what it can do. Right, where did the genesis of the idea come from here? Now, I said we ran these two studies at the, at the same time. So we didn't know for sure what would happen with the fasted um, versus carbohydrate fed. But the idea was that, okay, we're hypothesizing that carbohydrate might blunt some of the adaptations. However, would protein feeding also blunt it? Or would you retain the benefits of a no carbohydrate um, or a low or restricted carbohydrate feed and maybe have some additional benefits of the supply of energy in the form of protein and then potentially around that amino acid availability immediately post-exercise and for on a short exercise bout? And would that potentially help things like muscle protein synthesis? I'll, I'll acknowledge here that we didn't actually measure muscle protein synthesis. That is a follow-up I would like to do. So again, same paradigm, but this time when participants came in, if they were in the control group, they got their placebo. And if they were in the uh, either of the protein groups, they got their protein uh, first thing in the morning, 45 minutes before exercise, and then they would exercise and everything was the same as the other study I've described from there. Okay, so what did we find? So interestingly, um, when we looked at acute gene expression, um, Again, a couple of nice comforting pieces of security in our data. We saw the changes we would expect to see from a, an exercise training perspective when we, when we grouped all the participants together. Again, so all the genes you would expect to change were changing. Um, we, again, we were seeing changes in performance across, uh, across the board and so on. When we look at between group differences, we saw differences in uh, NMNAP. Uh, we saw it was increased in one of the whey protein conditions, which was interesting. Again, that's around that NAD biosynthesis pathway. Uh, 
And we saw changes in CD36 in the whey protein hydrolysis group, which was also interesting. So CD36, if you're not aware, is involved in fatty acid transport. Okay, so we thought that that was interesting, again, because it supported that idea of, in the absence of carbohydrate, potentially adaptations towards increased fatty acid metabolism, okay, or fatty acid oxidation. Um, from an acute protein perspective, we saw a greater acetylation and parallation of uh, cross, so panacetylation and parallation in the fasted condition. Um, so that wasn't clear what that meant to us. We were more interested here in the actual mm, overall chronic uh, change. So we saw no differences actually in acetylation or parallation levels uh, or mitochondrial sod or any of those things after chronic training. So after three weeks of training. From the metabolomics perspective, we saw major differences acutely. So as you would expect, right, we've given somebody nothing and then we've given others, you know, roughly 25 to 30 grams of protein. So obviously you see differences immediately pre and post exercises in amino acid metabolism and so on. And so again, all our data showed all that, but the main interest was pre and post training. Uh, what, what were the effects there? And what we saw in the fastest state were higher, medium and long chain acyl carnitines, again, which you, you'd expect to see. Um, and we saw no major differences. So when we did our principal component analysis, for example, again, we saw no change in the kind of global serum metabolome that we had measured. Um, and we saw some minor differences. But again, nothing that was consistent across, uh, let's say, groups of metabolites to suggest you know, a real change in phenotype between the conditions that, that, that didn't exist. Um, we saw similar changes in performance and um, with some beneficial changes actually in the protein condition, more looking at things like fatigue index within our Wingate analysis um, and looking at the last 15, 15, 10, five seconds of our Wingate. Now Wingate's only 30 seconds. So to break it down, you know, you're really looking for um, some differences. So we did find some in the protein condition, but if we looked at power output across uh, a Wingate, we didn't see changes. So we saw improvements in all groups, but not a difference between groups. Um, so they were the main differences that we that we saw between the protein and the fasted conditions. So if I give you the takeaways from my perspective or from our perspective at the time, one was we saw no blunting of the adaptations <clears throat> and to fasted, which was a positive. Okay, so we didn't see the same effect that we see with a carbohydrate. So when you fed a carbohydrate, we saw blunting of some of these things, but we didn't see that when we did it with the protein. And um, so that was a potential positive if the proteins can have other positive effects outside of what we were looking at here. Right. So I think that would be the main uh, takeaway. Uh, and that's that been shown. That's also um, been shown in some other work where protein uh, basically mimics to some extent the fasted state exercise yeah so uh katie hirsch uh, and other colleagues published some work looking at essential amino acids and some mitochondrial gene uh, adaptation and they had found actually similar to, to what we found i remember actually reading the paper when we were kind of mid analysis we're going oh god i read the title and i was like oh we definitely could be scooped here and uh, <laughs> but a re some really nice work um, and it actually our work aligns really well with there so the findings are, are, are quite similar and then the probably the, the main beneficial and you wouldn't hang your hat too much on this but was around the changes in cd36 in the, in, in the protein condition which are kind of hinting that maybe there might be some augmentation in the capability for fatty acid transport and metabolism but you'd be doing a lot of hand waving over here to to, to really suggest that okay um, again, we looked at, in those trials, we looked at citrate synthase and beta HAD. And again, we saw positive adaptations in both of these, but no difference between the groups. So most of the adaptations are, are pretty similar. Um, so certainly uh, pre-exercise protein did, had no negative impacts on, on the adaptations and potentially had some positive. Do you see any, um, I know you look at performance, but are there any like subjective things that you notice in your participants when they're in the fasted state versus either the protein or the carbohydrate fed state, like their ability to complete the bout of exercise is not impacted by pre by nutritional state. Yeah, no, actually not at all. Um, one of the things we did was we monitored the power output in every single trial. 
and every single rep in every single training session. And we actually have tried to do analysis on this and we've looked at it and we, we, we can't see any differences at all. And that would line up with, so um, the PhD student who did a lot of work on this, and I, I should have really given him credit earlier, um, Tom Erd. Um, so myself and Tom had published a, a systematic review and meta-analysis in 2018, which was a kind of prelude to some of this work, looking at FACID training and its impact on adaptations uh, uh, to, to training so you know we summarized the metabolism during there are other systematic reviews which do that as well very very well and um, we studied we looked at the impact on performance and so when the performance is short so when the, the challenge is short when it's less than an hour really the pre-exercise feeding doesn't really make much difference and um, after over an hour, we saw an effect in our meta-analysis, obviously favoring carbohydrate. So yeah, if you're going to exercise in your endurance athlete, then, then eat your carbs, <laughs> particularly for performance on the day. Um, and we're not, we weren't so worried about performance during the actual exercise. We were more interested in the adaptation. But the reality is, irrespective of condition, whether it was fasted versus protein or fasted versus carbohydrate, uh, there was no impact on the actual the amount of work they could do peak power output, fatigue index, or any of that within the actual session. Mm -hmm. so, no, there was no effect there. Yeah. And there may be, but no, there wasn't there was nothing at all. Yeah, no, that's super interesting. And you can only sustain high intensity exercise for so long. So it's going to be short just by virtue of the intensity. <laughs> and ultimately, you know, we, as we talked at the very beginning, the model is an overnight fast and a depletion of uh, liver, -like, liver glycogen. So ultimately, there's enough substrate there to fuel, fuel the exercise. So there was no real reason to expect any difference. I know this isn't your research, but do you think that there would be any utility like or difference? Or maybe you could get similar adaptations by extending the fasting window post-exercise? Um, like, does do you think post-exercise feeding and changing that duration would impact uh, these outcomes? Interesting. It's an interesting point. It's actually a question one of the reviewers had for us, and, and it was a legitimate question. Um, you know, like, why did you, on the training day, so on day one, we didn't feed anything for three hours post, and we took the biopsy, right. and, then, and then we fed after. Um, but then on the other eight days, we did feed them something 30 minutes post-exercise, as we mentioned earlier, and they said, well, why didn't you do what you did on day one? And I was saying, well, you know, ultimately, we're trying to investigate whether something was uh, practically relevant, whether, whether it was ecologically valid or not. And, and ultimately, people aren't going to every day come in overnight fast, train in the morning and then still not eat for another three or four hours. So we, we did what we thought was pragmatic, uh, I guess, in that point. But to your answer your question, I think it potentially could. I think the longer you're exposing it to that condition, then, then it could potentially have an impact. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we, again, we haven't we haven't tested that. So right. just to clarify for any listeners or anyone, any, any viewers, uh, you know what you see on day one. So looking at those acute changes, that's a slightly different paradigm than what we did for the other eight training sessions. Right. And so from these studies and even just your systematic review, like has do you you see a utility in using fasted exercise? as a way to augment adaptations and whether that has to do with athletic performance or just overall health um, what is your like practical takeaway from your research so far well first off i'd say ultimately a faster train certainly does no harm as in it doesn't seem to impact your adaptation so therefore it is a potential utility and um, we know that the within exercise um, metabolism, particularly if it's moderate type exercise, we know it from other people's research, not from ours, but that that is different um, and that it, it relies more on fatty acid metabolism. Okay, so potentially you're training um, the muscle to be able to do that to a greater extent. We show some adaptations that might suggest that also. Okay, not very strongly, but we do show some adaptations that, that, that point that direction, even for sprint interval training, which people wouldn't have expected maybe that that, that would happen based on yeah. the, um, the source of um, or substrate or, or source of our energy during during those training sessions at that intensity. Um, I would see it as, as a potential tool among a suite of tools uh, open to either recreational uh, athletes or 
even uh, high-end athletes. And we know that elite athletes are already using faster training. So one of my other PhD students, Connor Raleigh, um, this work is unpublished, but we have surveyed um, athletes um, from national standard level. So they're national, international, and then up as high as world class. So as far as high as Olympic finalists have completed the survey um, and even world medalists. And um, we see that over 30% of elite athletes are using fasted training in their training uh, programs right now. And they use it at some point in the season. Some have even using it right up to the competition phase. So I, I think it is being used by those e even at the top end of sport. So it potentially has a tool. And our research certainly shouldn't put you off it. Um, so if it is a tool within your arsenal, then nothing in our research would suggest not to do that. So Jerry, I think it's there. Oh, sorry. Yeah, and I, I, I will point out one thing. We we have certain sensitivity around all of the tests that we do, and you know, again, I'm hand waving a little bit, and um, particularly in the performance tests we did, we did a kind of twenty minute uh, time trial, and we did a Wingate. Uh, ultimately, we have a certain sensitivity in those, and whether our three week protocol or our sensitivity within those is, is sensitive enough to see differences between groups. That's not entirely clear either. So, um, look, we we can only take the data at face value, and that shows that we didn't have any differences in those performance. But ultimately, I, I think there's something there, and there's certainly nothing in our research to suggest that you shouldn't do. It. Yeah, um, and I forgot, but now I remember what I was going to say. Um, like athletes that use fasted training or fasted exercise in their training protocol. I feel maybe I'm just assuming, but most of them are probably doing like using it with moderate intensity exercise. Like they're probably not like, oh, I'm going to do my fasted hit to get my adaptations. Do you think that that's going to change? Like as research emerges, like, cause I, do you think most people would think that they need pre-exercise fuel for a high intensity training belt? Depends on the, on the, the nature of, so high intensity is a broad spectrum, right? Right. So for sprint interval training, I think it is a potential. So if we go back to the systematic review, ultimately we show that even your performance, even within that session, shouldn't be impacted. And all our training data shows us that your performance within that session is not impacted right. and by your pre-exercise. So nutrition. So you can have a carb, you can have protein, you, you can do it fasted, and that's not impacted. So I think that broadens the, the use of of it as a tool and uh, from that perspective so i don't think we do need our to be carb loaded before we go into a sprint interval training session now bear in mind remember this is four to six 30 seconds if you're doing a long ride on top of that perhaps and then you you do four to 30 second bouts within that that might be slightly different but if you're going just to do a hit or sprint interval training session then i think you can use it yeah and that's different because if you're doing it at the end of a ride you're you're glycogen depleted a bit so that's Correct. that's a different scenario, I guess. Um, so what's next? Like, what do we, what do you think we need to understand more about the potential benefits of fasted training? So I think there's um, two avenues I'd like to explore. One we chatted about actually beforehand. Some of your own research is going to be really interesting um, on this. And I might let you explain on what you're going to do there, but I'm, I might tee it up a little bit. But if, if the first one, one of the things I'd like to do to follow up is I'd actually like to look at muscle protein synthesis in that protein fed condition versus fast. Right. Um, so, and um, perhaps using something like a uh, deuterated water technique, which we've used um, with the guys in Nottingham and Phil Atherton and those guys, Kenny Smith. Um, if we could do that over a five hour window around the session, I think we would see differences um, in muscle protein synthesis. That's just my hypothesis you know, to be, to, to be proven. Um, so that is one piece of research I would like to do. Um, but the other piece is, and, and that might have implications for both health and performance. And the other piece that I think is interesting around health is potentially around glucose control. So some of these markers that we've looked at, obviously you want to influence around glucose control. And I know that you're interested in this area and looking at fasted versus fed training and what that, the implications that potentially for, you know, I guess recreational or healthy adults, but then also for potentially metabolically compromised adults, even obese or type twos. 
Um, so I, I think that that's interesting. Um, I know that one of the studies, one of the only studies that looked at, uh, uh, I guess, altering nutrients around high intensity interval training was done by, performed by Jenna Gillen. Um, and we had looked at that study a lot actually in, in, in preparation. And Jenna was kind enough to share a protocol for us on the beta HAD assay actually. Yeah. Um, so they saw no difference after training in, in obese female group. Um, but yeah, I do think there's potential applications there. Or there's, there's more to be found out in that space. Yeah, actually, when you brought up the Gillen paper, I was going to actually ask a question about that because I wonder, I wonder if like the population that we use is going to dictate the outcomes that we see because of just our differences in metabolic flexibility um, and how that would influence our fuel substrates during exercise. And if that's at all related to these adaptations, then it w our pre-exercise training status and our health status would impact the outcomes that we're finding. And then that might impact the recommendations. So it could be, yeah, differential. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think metabolic flexibility is a, is a, an exciting area to look at um, in terms of different fuels around um, peri peri training, if you like. Um, you know, for me, if you I think it's quite simple, particularly if you've got a metabolically compromised uh, group of individuals. You know, limiting the carbohydrate to an extent is seems somewhat sensible. It's a nutrient that they're not very good at handling in in, in the first place. So, you know, performing some exercise in the fastest state without carbohydrate, I think, you know, is a potential paradigm that will be beneficial. Now, the way I always thought about it was potentially exercise in the morning after an overnight fast for that population, you know, that could be a way to go. But then interestingly, you know, I see a lot of the chrononutrition um, research coming out and chrono exercise uh, research coming out right now suggests that exercising in the evening is actually uh, it results in greater adaptation. So right. maybe that knocks me on the head for, for my ideas from that perspective. Well, those people with insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes have opposite um circadian rhythms and insulin sensitivity too from a non-diabetic because like he healthy non-diabetics are most insulin sensitive in the morning and i think it's opposite for type 2 diabetics which maybe this explains difference in exercise metabolism too yeah and i i know that um and gabriel and julian zirat and those guys published um, some work on which looked at actually hit am and pm hit in type twos and again it seemed that their CGM data suggested that PM exercise was potentially uh, more beneficial. But I think there's a lot more to come from that perspective. So this, inter this interaction between the peri-training nutrition plus the timing and so on, I think there's, there's a lot more for us to explore in that space. But yeah. I think around uh, metabolically compromised populations, yeah, I think there's, there's potentially some fruit there. Yeah, there's so much unknown. How do you think, if you have thought about this or hypothesis, have any hypotheses around it, um, how things would change if you were to look at females? Do you think there would be any differences? I don't. Look, we, we used a, a male-only population here. We would like to, and look, I think this is a right, there's a call to action in, in our discipline to include more females in our research, and I, I, I'd have to agree with that. Um, I think we often do it because of maybe a lack of knowledge um, around um, the menstrual cycle, the phases, and how that might influence metabolism. I think metabolic researchers are particularly uh, scared of it and the complications that, that might arise. So I think, do think we need to do a little bit more on that. Um, do I think there'll be differences? I'm not sure. Um, potentially, female capacity for increased fatty acid metabolism may suggest so that actually the some of the changes might be augmented in a female but i'm really only hand waving when i say that it, you know it's something that we probably do need to do so and um, that's something we could follow up on or if other labs wanted to try and replicate what we've done in, in a female population be more than welcome and i'd certainly be willing, open to collaborate with anybody who wants to do that as well cool all right so what's in the pipeline for you what's uh new and exciting on the uprise so just on the exercise and nutrient interaction theme, um, we have some more um, protein hydrolysis studies on the way out, uh, looking at resistance training in, in, in older adults. Mm, cool. And like I, like I said, just related to the discussion today, the one I'd really like to do is the, 
is the muscle protein synthetic response to pre-exercise protein for sprint interval training. That's what I would like to do. Um, yeah. So look, maybe somebody will get there before me, but yeah, we'd like to do that. <laughs> um, I did actually want to point out that what was interesting about your protein versus fasted is that it's like you would expect an insulin response to the protein feeding. So that even though you're not feeding the carbohydrates, you still have an increase in insulin and you wouldn't have that in the fasted group. So these adaptations must be independent of insulin because you're also seeing them in the carbohydrate feeding group. So it must be related to carbohydrate availability rather than this hormonal response to feeding. Do you think? Yeah. Yeah. That would be my take, um, that it's not necessarily a, a result of the insulin. Um, and like I said earlier on, we didn't measure the insulin, but we knew insulin was going to be up in the carbohydrate state. We also knew it would be up in the in the protein right. and fed state. So we've used um, the whey protein concentrate that we use in this. We haven't used this particular hydrolysis in, in other studies, but we've used other hydrolysis. We see an insulin response, you know, peaking at around 45 minutes, so actually peaking at around the start of exercise. Right. Um, <clears throat> but no, I, I think it's independent of insulin and um, yeah. what we're seeing here. And that's really interesting because we're, we're final, like we're chipping away at what potential mechanisms could be explaining differential adaptations, which is, which is cool and which gets me excited. <laughs> Yeah, look, it, it, science is iterative. We, 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 we try and solve one piece or maybe advance things one, one small piece at a time. So hopefully our studies have contributed something um, from that, something novel from that perspective. And I think we've definitely added a little bit to the metabolomic um, research around exercise and, and, and nutrition. So, uh, yeah, so hopefully it's something people can take from the papers. Yeah, no, they're awesome. I love reading. I love I've read that systematic review a few times. So it's, it's definitely motivated a lot of my research. So I appreciate all of your work. No, thank you very much. No, thanks for thanks for the interest. It's always uh, very flattering to hear people reading your and citing your work. So yeah. And uh, yeah, we're always delighted. <laughs> Every citation we, you know, it's, it's always a nice little bonus to see that someone's read and cited your work. So yeah, it's good. well, you'll have some from me in the in the future <laughs> one day if i ever conduct any research um but we'll wrap this up here this was amazing i had so much fun chatting with you and i learned a lot and yeah no this was just awesome and i really appreciate your time so if people want to learn more about you do you want to put out your links or um yeah what i'll do is i'll maybe send you um my twitter link and then um, maybe send you a link to the university I should highlight if people want to read uh, the latest paper, it's going to come out um, next month in March in the International Journal of Sport, Nutrition, and Exercise Metabolism. And it's actually the, the highlighted paper um, in the issue. So it's actually going to be uh, open access for between this issue and the next issue. And um, so we're really delighted with that because I really expect it, respect the editorial team at that journal. It's a really strong journal and I read a lot of strong research in there. So really flattered to be uh, to be highlighted and um, in, in this particular issue so yeah if people want to check it out it'll be open access and free awesome hear that people for all of march open access get your hands on it and a big congratulations for getting that being the highlighted paper for the issue so that's awesome um so yeah thank you so much and uh i'm sure we will be in touch a lot moving forward but i'm happy One we got final the time plug. to chat Mm -hmm. One final plug. Thanks a million for the uh, invitation, Christy. One final plug. We're hoping uh, we're hosting the International Biochemistry of Exercise Conference here at the University of Limerick in July 2024, the 9th to the 11th. So look, keep an eye out. We'll we'll be on social media and we'll have a program out and so on. And um, we'd really like people's abstracts and people to come and see Limerick, see uh, the southwest of Ireland and all it has to offer. And uh, I think we'll be able to put on a really great meeting. Generally, at the IBEC meetings, the quality of scientists is, is really high, and we'll be looking to keep that um, the case this time around. So hope to see you all in Limerick in 2024. Yep, so, I will 100% be there. So I'll see you and there. Unashamed plug. <laughs> no, that's awesome. IBEC was awesome, and I'm already looking forward to you coming to Ireland for the next one. Yeah, we're, looking, we're, we're, we're delighted to be hosting it and to be given the opportunity. And uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing everybody there. So. I look forward to seeing you again. Yeah, likewise. All right. Thank you so much, Brian. Thanks, Chrissy.